How's everybody doing? Okay, so uh, uh, as, a, uh, as an educator myself, uh, this whole planning on a break, not getting the break thing is normally uh, kind of bad mojo. So what I'd, what I'd like is for at least everyone to stand up for a second and just shake them out a little bit and then we'll get going, right? Good. All right. Awesome. Was that helpful? OK, great. OK, so as you settle back in, my name is, uh, is Mike Barger, and I uh, do run uh, operations at Corp U. Uh, I am here with my good friend and colleague, uh, Ken Murphy, who is the executive vice president of sales and ops at uh, Mattress Firm, as you heard in the introductions. And we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time with you talking about this idea of building virtual learning communities that drive business performance. Um, here's, uh, we, we understand that we're the, we're the last session between you and lunch, or you and departing, or, or whatever, and that's uh, probably the, t the second toughest session, uh, right behind the one right after lunch. But uh, we'll try to make this uh, uh, entertaining and informative all at the same time. And here's how I'd like this session to run. I'm going to talk to you for about uh, 20 minutes or so about some uh, experiences that I've had over a couple of different careers. I'll show you what those look like in a moment. And some things that I've learned about, uh, about training programs and what works particularly well. Uh, I am not going to try to convince you that you should be thinking about virtual learning communities. I think that what you've seen in the conference so far about uh, social media and how, how it could help, and you probably have questions about how can we leverage this stuff. Uh, we watched the, the Twitter uh, 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 pacing as the conference has gone on, and we've seen the, the, the tweeting spikes when, uh, you know, when we start talking about social media. So we know that's of interest to you. I, my job is to push back a little bit on how you're doing things today. I want to open up a few questions about why are we doing things the way that we're doing them today? Maybe we'll arrive at that as a destination, but I just want to give you some things to, uh, to think about. I'll do that for about 20 minutes. And I'm, I know I'm eating into that 20 minutes now. I'll turn the floor over to Ken. He'll chat with you for, uh, I don't know, two to three minutes, 20 minutes, something. Whatever right. remains. Whatever, so, great. Yep. And, uh, and then just to tell you a little bit about uh, Mattress Firm, a great example of a super fast growing company, uh, challenges with a distributed workforce and trying to, to develop all of those folks that, that don't live around the headquarters unit. And then we'll end the session with a little bit of Q&A between ourselves. We'll go back to the objectives of the conference. We'll actually put up a slide that says, here's what you're supposed to, you know, this is why you should attend the conference. Uh, and if we've got some time, we've got a roving mic, we'll pass around and we'll get some of your questions too. So does that sound okay? All right, well, I'm glad because that's what we're going to do. Great. <laughs> how convenient. Right. That works yeah, so how well. convenient. That's perfect. Okay. So, um, so I have, uh, before joining Corp U, I had two just uh, incredibly rewarding careers. I spent 13 years as a fighter pilot in the United States Navy. Uh, I uh, was a, oh, well, thank you. I wasn't going for that, but uh, I appreciate it. Um, and it is interesting to me how many uh, presenters in this conference have put pictures of themselves up on the, at the beginning of the, I don't know what that is. There wasn't a memo or anything, it just is working that way. Um, so I was a, a trainer, a flight instructor. I spent three years at a, a little school you might have heard of called uh, Top Gun. Uh, I ran the place for about a year and a half and learned a lot about uh, training through that experience. Uh, after I did that for 13 years, I was uh, a part of a group that started up a little company that uh, you might have heard of before. It's called uh, JetBlue. And I, was, uh, I went there to help build the, the L&D function at that company. And we applied a lot of what we learned at Top Gun to uh, how we built uh, training at JetBlue. And so I want to use that as a bridge, as a way to talk about the things that, that, were, that were similar uh, uh, with the way that we approach training at those two places, and use those lessons as a bridge to the question of, why are we so in love or committed to this notion of instructor-led training in a classroom lecture style like we're doing today? Uh, I, that, that's the, the question I'm going to pose. And hopefully that takes us to this, this question of, uh, well, are there other ways that we should be thinking about learning and some benefits of these other kind of media-friendly uh, kinds of approaches? So there we go. So we'll start with this whole uh, this, this Top Gun thing. So. I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with, uh, with that organization through uh, Hollywood. Uh, to, um, <clears throat> to, uh, uh, for a shock of uh, reality, uh, for those of you that remember the movie, it came out almost 27 years ago. OK. Anybody in here less than 27 years old to make us really? Thank you very much. Yes. 
So, OK, so 27 years ago. Uh, so two things that you're probably uh, wondering about uh, the movie and, and my association with Top Gun. One, uh, no, the movie had almost no resemblance to what actually goes on at the Navy Fighter Weapons School. And two, I'm sure you're wondering, yes, I met Tom Cruise, and he's about that tall. So, <clears throat> okay, so, so a couple of things that, uh, that, that, that the Top Gun experience, uh, uh, I, I think is worth thinking about from a Top Gun perspective. Um, and by the way, while Top Gun was a great um, uh, kind of brand builder for the Navy and was incredibly beneficial for recruiting, uh, it almost devastated the Top Gun brand inside the Navy uh, because it was pretty Hollywood and not really what we did. Um, but two things, I think, from Top Gun that are worth taking away. One is this notion of brand. And uh, as, a, uh, as a researcher at Corp U, <clears throat> we spend lots of time working with organizations, helping them develop the brand of their learning function because we believe, and the research suggests, that having a better learning brand makes your learners more interested in you know, taking what you have to offer, showing up prepared, staying engaged while you're you know, doing your, uh, your training. So this whole idea of brand is really important. Top Gun is, in my opinion, pretty much the poster child of having built a really strong brand around kind of the mission that it serves. Okay? So I think that idea of brand is something interesting to take away, which reminds me I meant to open with I'd like you to think about some of these, these highlights that I bring up in the context of what you're doing at your organization. So you know, it's great to have speakers talk about what they've done. I think what's really important in these kinds of sessions, think about what we're doing. So how many of you are kind of classic educators, L&D people, trainers, those kind of folks? All right, so half or so. OK, good. So, this is, so a lot of this is, is really for you to think about, because you're probably more closely connected with this is how we do things at our organization. So this whole idea of brand is the first one. The second idea is uh, the extent to which the program that we ran here was aligned with the strategic objective of the business. Right? So clearly, the uh, United States military is about national defense. The Navy's mission is about defending the interest of the United States, typically off of somebody else's shoreline. And whenever we think about conducting some sort of exercise or activity or conflict in the Navy, the very first thing that we think about is how do we gain advantage in the airspace over wherever that conflict is taking place. So you may have heard the term air superiority. That really is a strategic objective of the Navy. And so this course was built entirely to help us optimize the probability of achieving air superiority. So as we look back through kind of the history of aviation back from when it started in the early 1900s, you know, whether it was World War I, gaining air superiority, whether it was World War II, again, gaining air superiority, or in the 50 years that followed, all of the conflicts start with gaining some sort of superiority in the airspace over the, the area of conflict. And so again, I think the, the headline here is, almost perfect alignment between kind of the objective of the program or the course and the strategic objective of the enterprise. So, you know, for me, the takeaway is anytime you're building something, if you're not asking the question, how does this thing help support one of the objectives of the organization, you, if you haven't asked that question, you, you should stop and go address that question. Okay. Another takeaway from the Top Gun experience, looking at this old uh, black and white, is that the faculty uh, all came from the operation. They were all expert operators. Um, and so I don't know how you set up the training departments at, uh, you know, at your organization, um, but I'm guessing it's from really one of two paths. It's either operational experts that you brought in to become teachers, many of whom probably had no idea how to teach, or teachers, you know, trainers, that came up through the training ranks and maybe weren't as closely connected with the operation as you'd like. So I think the headline here is that, is that what we did at uh, Top Gun is we took great operators, we brought them into the organization, we spent over a year in a three-year tour teaching them how to teach so that the last two years that they were on staff, they would be effective teachers with the credibility of operators. So I think that's a good takeaway from how we thought about the staff. Another takeaway from the Top Gun experience was we learned that uh, you can't teach fighter pilots how to be great fighter pilots in a classroom. All right, you can start there, you can give them some basic fundamentals, you can help share some knowledge, you can help build their toolbox a little bit in a classroom, but the value of multiple modes of learning, 
of the building block approach using you know, different types of technology and different uh, you know, size groups and different scenarios is something that you should be applying to pretty much everything that you do, and that certainly played out here. The, the idea of simulation is uh, kind of the classic methodology of the, of the Top Gun model, so, uh, and a dependence on uh, technology, clearly uh, something that, uh, that was done a lot there. But ultimately, the objective of the whole Top Gun mission was that when we got one of our fighter pilots in a position like this uh, behind some unfortunate uh, uh, opposition forces that she was able to put her aircraft from that position and into this position uh, to relieve the opposing pilot of the burden of his equipment, okay? <laughs> Great, okay, so that's the goal. So alignment, okay, is the headline there. So fast forward. We start up JetBlue, a uh, small group of us. Uh, I guess you could argue that air superiority was the, uh, the objective of JetBlue as well. A <laughs> little different variety. Um, but from a training perspective, same kinds of concepts. In fact, the first thing that I did when we, when we finally decided to launch the company, we got our funding, we had our business plan in place, is I reached out to a couple of my former Top Gun colleagues, and they helped me start JetBlue University. So we took the same model, principles, lessons learned. The first thing we did was uh, we built a nice training facility, clearly uh, in the airline business, you know, uh, a commitment to technology and spending on pilot training and flight attendant training is something that you would naturally expect. So we did commit to some of the very best technology. We applied a lot of the principles that we learned at Top Gun. One of the things that I would call out in the lower left-hand corner of the screen there is uh, it is not that common in the airline industry. Anyone here from the airline industry? Okay, good. It is not as common in the airline industry to dedicate the same kind of technology and simulation to flight attendant training as it is to pilot training, and that was something that we decided at JetBlue was not okay. So we built uh, two different types of cabin trainers for not just flight attendant training, but training with flight attendants and pilots together. And so as far as I know, around the world, we, uh, JetBlue dedicates more time to combined pilot and flight attendant training uh, so that when you are in situations that are normal, everything works particularly well. And when you're in situations that are not so normal, if uh, you recall this, uh, this very well-publicized event out at LAX, uh, is that the crew continues to work really well together. So again, I think there's, a, there's not only a commitment to technology and simulation, a commitment to training over a, an extended period of time, but this commitment to kind of collaborative and team building type training, which uh, in my experience has worked really well. So all that said, you looking at your watch yet? No, no, we're good. Okay, good. So all that said, are there some, are there some commonalities that we can take away from these that might be worth uh, thinking about? And the answer, I think, is uh, yes. So up in the upper right-hand corner there, here are the things that, that if I had to boil down the headlines of what, was really, what were really valuable takeaways from what we did at the, the Top Gun School and what we did at JetBlue, uh, here they are. Uh, and, and this is where I would ask you to think about how you're doing things today. So for expert, for expert content and delivery, are, you, are your uh, educators, are they expert deliverers that are working towards being credible with the content? Or are they expert operators and content and working at becoming expert educators? I, don't, I, I think you have to have both of those to be really effective. That's from our experience. Um, is the training aligned to what you're doing in the business? And that's something that we've, as, educa as corporate educators, have heard a lot about. Uh, but I think it's something that we, we just can't ask that question enough. Are we building skills from scratch to mastery? You know, so when we talk about this question of classroom-based instruction or you know, one-shot lecture-style, workshop-based kind of uh, education, are we giving enough time for people to build skills toward mastery? I, I don't know. I, we're not seeing that as much as, as we'd like to. Uh, deliberate practice, so practice that lets people put their hands on things and try it and see how well it, uh, it works so that they can fail and learn from failure and, and build on that. A collaborative team approach, as I talked about with the JetBlue uh, piece. And even in the, the fighter pilot world, while we teach fighter pilots as, as individuals, uh, military aircraft don't go out and fly around alone. They fly around in twos or fours or eights, or they fly around with other forces. So it's definitely you know, steeped in this whole idea of it, it is a team approach. Uh, heavy uh, reliance on technology, and then descriptive versus prescriptive, just meaning that we, we didn't succeed in those training programs because we told folks, given this scenario, follow this checklist. There were some checklists, but our philosophy was more, 
we can't begin to define all of the scenarios that you might find yourself in, so here is your toolbox, here is the way you should be thinking about things and framing things, and then apply what you've learned to this particular scenario. So it's kind of the, the, kind of the descriptive approach. Okay, so all of that now leads me to my time at Corpu. So one of the things that we do at Corpu is we spend a lot of time uh, in the research area. So for 15 years, we've been working with organizations, thousands of organizations, asking them what's working really well for you, what's not working really well for you, what would you like to work better uh, than it's doing today, and what we find uh, as one of the most common challenges that organizations are struggling with is their reliance on this, okay? And so what is it that is it's driving us here? What is it about you know, the lecture format, the classroom format, the very short tail, one shot, they should get it all from me, this is good enough? What is it? Why, why are we there? You know, is it a time issue? It's just easier to put together. Is it a cost issue? It's cheaper? I don't know. We'll, we'll come back to these in a little bit. Is it a culture issue? Have we, have we decided that having people in a room together is really important culturally, or is it something else? I'm not here to tell you any of these are right or wrong. Uh, what I'm asking you to do is look at the way you do business now and push back a little bit on what are our assumptions? Are we assuming that this is the best approach? Are we assuming that there are no other alternatives? Are we really thinking about those, those alternatives? So a few things that we do know, uh, and this is, uh, we'll put this in the category of useless dinnertime trivia for you. So uh, we'll, uh, I'll have uh, uh, Mr. Peabody set the Wayback Machine to uh, 384 BC. How many uh, Wayback Machine people? Yeah, huh? Okay, 27 years, Top Gun, Wayback Machine, same time frame. <clears throat> so, uh, so here we have uh, you know, Plato, who started his academy out here in the Grove, and uh, mastering the, you know, teaching through the art of the dialectic, right, which is not really debate or argument, it's just kind of uh, multiple perspectives on a problem. Let's just think through what the truth is. We fast forward up to the very first university that came into play here in Bologna in, in the 14th century. And uh, thanks to uh, Peter Norvig, who, uh, who has let me borrow this uh, slide. He uses it in one of his uh, presentations out at Stanford. But uh, you know, here in this uh, painting, you know, we see all the things that we've come to know and love, the sage on the stage, you know, the lectern and the textbook that we're teaching out of, the distracted uh, participant in the back row. I'm sure it was some sort of Apple product, the, the eye abacus or something was uh, going on back there in the back. And then we've got our sleeping, our sleeper body up here in the front, uh, like this gentleman over here. No, that's okay. Uh, so, so this was, you know, all the things that we've come to know and love. They've been doing it for centuries now. We fast forward the clock a little bit, and, and you know, on the left we see Andreas Vassilius in uh, in Basel, Switzerland, conducting the very first public. Uh, um, uh, dissection of a convicted felon. So this was the way they taught medicine back there, as we all know, have seen the evolution of, uh, of medical teaching. James Dewar in the 19th century talking about chemistry and again in the lecture format. And there's Joe Smith that, uh, you know, any company or any school USA last week that had the PowerPoint and the projector and the whiteboard, <clears throat> is, is that the answer? Is that, is that the right answer? And so, you know, you've seen uh, at least the top quote, I'm sure. Um, you know, one of, the reasons, one of the reasons you come to conferences like this is so that you can get these little uh, quippy quotes and take them back home and put them in your stuff. Uh, there's what Mark Twain said about uh, lectures. Okay, and then uh, Albert Camus, uh, who was a French philosopher, uh, talked about how, you know, uh, some people talk in their sleep and lecturers talk while other people sleep, and hopefully I'm not demonstrating that same thing for you. Um, but, you know, to me, it kind of, it, it does beg this question, you know, why, why do we do it this way? You know, is it really the law of the instrument? Is it that, hey, we've got the lecture, we're good at it, we've done it, we've got PowerPoint, we've got our projectors, so everything's a nail, right? Everything should be served by the lecture, and I don't think that that's the case. So as we talk about this, I'm not driving you toward these virtual learning communities, I thought maybe we could entertain you a little bit before lunch, uh, but really more of a, why shouldn't we be doing what we're doing, okay? Why? How should we be thinking about the time that we spend with people in a, in a lecture hall or in an instructor-led kind of session? Do we really think that what we're teaching them is sticking, that they have a chance to play with it, to contextualize it, to, to, to build it into something that they find useful when they leave the classroom? Or are we happy enough with a nice level one survey that says that they like the donuts and a level two that they passed the quiz so they must know what's going on, we're good to go. And they've now built, a, and they've built an action plan. So I'm sure that they're gonna go out after the session and really work hard on that action plan. We don't see that happening, okay? So why is it that we do that? Is it time, is it cost, is it culture, is there something else? Uh, and I think there's more to it. 
A couple of things that we do know about stand-up instruction, and you can also put these into the useless dinner time trivia category, is that you may not know this gentleman's name, Herman Ebenhaus, back in 1885, but you know the work that he did, because he's the first one that said, hey, we forget things pretty quick. You know, unless there's some sort of reinforcement or repetition. And so over the years from 1885, thousands of studies that have validated his work and that have gone on to say, people need the opportunity to try stuff. They need an opportunity to reinforce it and to repeat it to the, to the point that they, can, uh, that they can remember things. And that, of course, assumes that what we're teaching them to remember in the first place is important, right? And that, which is, to me, I always find a fascinating question. We spend a lot of time talking about things that are they, you know, in the big scheme of things, are they really that important, okay? Hundreds of studies in comparing kind of the lecture method to other methods of, of teaching, and every single one of them, not just virtual learning communities, say there are better ways to do things, all right? Um, Cal Wick, a good friend of ours from the Fort Hill Company, uh, did a great job of putting together this graphic just to drive home the point that if you're only focused on the instructional piece of it, you haven't prepared properly, you haven't worked on transfer and application and continued practice down the line, you're not gonna get the results that you want. You're not gonna reach the finish line, okay? Now we see these things happening. Uh, this is Daphne Kohler, who, uh, who was one of the founders of Coursera, who is a real force behind this whole massive open online courseware movement, uh, where it seems that all of the excitement is around um, how many thousands of people can we get to sign up for these courses. And, and I think, I think this is a great, uh, a really great way to get information and knowledge out to a population of folks that probably wouldn't have had access to it otherwise. But from a, from a learning leader or a business leader in a corporation perspective, I just, I, I have to ask, is it, is it worth the, you know, should I invest in it? You know, it might be great for individuals. Is it, is it helping me in the business? Is, it, is this stuff really contextualized to the point that, that it can be applied and beneficial in a kind of a business setting? I don't know. Um, but if you haven't seen Daphne's uh, TED presentation, that's what this is, the cover page for TED, it's, it's fantastic. And it's the kind of thing that should, it's, you know, TED's whole idea is this whole spreading ideas thing, right? So you, you should be thinking about that because it's, it's helpful, it's beneficial. Okay, one of the slides that in from her presentation uh, talks about this, uh, this Bloom's Two Sigma problem, uh, which is a, 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 just really kind of gets to the point of what we've been talking about, which is this lecture-based format. You know, here's the performance scores over on the left. Uh, we know through, again, thousands of studies that as people uh, uh, work in different ways to achieve mastery before they're able to move on in their learning, perform a full standard deviation better than the lecture only, and then when you throw in some sort of individual you know, support, one-on-one -on -one support, as now we're, you know, we're two standard deviations away. And the, the graphic over on the right with the bodies just says that if you move from the lecture only to the kind of one-on-one -on -one tutoring model, you're moving two standard deviations, which basically means that 98% of the people are better than average compared to the lecture only group. Right? So, the, so the problem is, where do we find the resources to get one-on-one -on -one, you know, teaching for you know, hundreds of thousands of people? Um, our theory is not that, and our being Corp U, our theory is not that it's about this massive open online courses, that the support for the tutoring actually comes from the, 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 your peers in your learning cohort. Okay, this peer to this notion of peer to peer learning. That's where the, the coach, the peer to peer coaching and support can come from. And that's, uh, that's how we think about the world. So as I look at my kind of categories of why are you doing it, up on the right, upper right is the things that I've learned from, from my time at Top Gun and JetBlue. And what we're seeing here <clears throat> at CorpU as we work with different organizations is the things down on the bottom right are those extra things that we see that technology is allowing us to, to, to make better and to improve on, that, we, that we, we do believe that you can build really effective virtual communities. It can be done. There are companies that are doing it. Ken is gonna talk a little bit about how they're doing it at, uh, at Mattress Firm. Um, that by uh, using the technology or using a, a cohort kind of team-based learning approach that uh, not only do you contextualize the learning, so you put the learning in the context of the organization, but that community of learners creatively solves problems that the educators and the leaders of the company may not have known existed in the first place, which I think is a spectacular outcome from some of the work that's being done here. And then, you know, one of the things we, we kind of talk about at Corp U uh, is that this, this notion of, of harnessing the collective genius of your organization. 
right? And giving people a place and an opportunity to share kind of their perspective on business problems in the context of these, uh, these educational communities, which is pretty cool. So my last couple of pictures here, and then I'll turn it over to Ken. Are we, are we out of time yet? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Um, is, uh, is that, you know, here is, um, you know, the website from the Penn CLO program. By the way, they're downstairs, great program. You should go talk to those people. Sound good, Laurie? Okay, good, excellent. Uh, went through the program myself. Think it's, a, it's just, it's a fantastic way to kind of round out your learning leader uh, education. But anyway, I bring this page up um, to say, this is kind of the new print media, right? A website, piece of cake, uh, you know, we're used to seeing those now. So what we're able to do, I don't have a pointer here, but up in the upper right hand corner where it says, you know, current uh, student login, um, we actually have built the technology that lets you go from a very kind of common standard, uh, comfortable website into a place where you can build these virtual learning communities, where you can give people places to, you know, to go in a kind of social media format and kind of connect with each other and learn from each other. Uh, you can also use it as a way to, you know, distribute news events or, or build that kind of relationships with members of your community. Alan Todd, whose picture is in the, in the middle of that screen there, who's the CEO at Corpu, likes to talk about these platforms uh, as the, 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 the confluence of the cathedral and the bazaar. And for those of you that have read that book, Cathedral and the Bazaar, that was written uh, back at the, in 1999 by the team that built the Linux operating system, the book talks about, more useless dinner time trivia for you, the book talks about how when they started the Linux project is that all of the senior team of engineers had this idea that, that they, would, they would hire thousands of developers they would tell all the developers what they should do and that the developers would just write all the code and the, the system would get built. And during the several year process, what the head engineer learned was that those frontline coders were, were pushing uphill these great ideas for improvements in the system that this core team of engineers never thought that there'd be value coming from the masses, right? It's the grassroots improvement kind of thing. So he wrote this book to say, that sweet spot between top down, which is the cathedral, hey, we've got some ideas, we've got a vision, we've got a mission, we've got some guidance, <clears throat> and the right, the right kinds of grassroots bottom up, that's which he called bizarre because there's a very broad range of ideas for any of you that have done these grassroots kind of, uh, you know, idea kinds of uh, things. Um, they produce a very wide range of, uh, of feedback, but some of those ideas are really spectacular. So the idea for us on these virtual learning communities is that right mix of the, the cathedral and the bazaar, and that's what we're trying to accomplish here. So this is where the Penn Silo students would go, and then one tab to the left, and we now have this virtual community to help people after they graduate from the program to stay connected. Again, it's just a way to focus the learning. So it's, uh, it's, it's working pretty well so far. We, uh, we like the way it's going. And even really cool groups of people like the World Economic Forum are looking at mechanisms like this to connect people all over the world because they believe, like we do, that uh, communities don't have to be face-to-face. -face. And you can do some really great work there uh, without that. Um, we also feel that, uh, that building courses <coughs> in, a, in a social media kind of way is a great way to kind of get the best of both worlds. Expert content built in a technology platform that gives people access kind of when, where they want it, when they want it, how they want it, but in a kind of a community context that lets them contextualize the learning in the organization, build, uh, you know, kind of tight cohort uh, bonds, and share ideas and creatively prob uh, solve problems, which is, which is the way we think about it. So with that, I think that was only like 11 minutes. Yeah, right? pretty That's much. You gave me. Good? But, by okay. my count, too. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to my friend Ken for uh, 47 seconds of uh, Mattress Firm, and then we, uh, we'll end with a little bit of Q&A, if that's OK. Excellent. So right, thank good. you, Michael. That was a, um, we, we knew we had 40 minutes. Mike said five or six slides. He came in with 39. Uh, so um, <laughs> nonetheless, I am uh, very excited to have an opportunity to visit with you. I'm very grateful, quite frankly, to be here uh, and, and really a little sort of in awe at how it all came together. This is actually my very first um, HCI conference, even as a participant, let alone a presenter, and yet even against that backdrop, I was somehow able, or the good folks here, to secure the sort of highly sought after, often fought over, deeply coveted time spot of being the guy right before lunch where we didn't have a break and we have eight minutes. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really good about that. Moreover, I'm sort of grateful for the, really the, the, the pairing of presentations. As I listened to Mike talk, I was just sort of struck by the similarities uh, really between us. I mean, Mike, uh, you know, sort of tall, good-looking guy, you know, life in a, um, you know, 
Top Gun flight instructor, founded JetBlue Airlines, and, um, and I've sold mattresses for 15 years, so I got that working for me. So really, um, really, really, really struck by the commonality between us two. It's, you know, sort, sort of classic separated at birth. Um, but in any event, be that as is may, I actually am sort of quite proud of the fact and, and quite grateful for the opportunity to be a part of the company that I am. Mattress Firm uh, is an organization, I'll give you a little bit of context for who we are, only sort of in the larger context of what we're trying to do relative to some of the, the topics that have been talked about here. Uh, the, the title of what was going to be my 20 and will now be my seven minute presentation, Breakneck Bench Building, that is the reality that we have in our world. We're trying to build bench, as it were, at a pretty breakneck uh, speed. So. Um, there we go. Just a, a real quick snapshot of who Mattress Firm is. For those of you that um, I, I don't know from where all you hail, we're not in this part of the country, we're not in the upper Midwest, and we're not out west yet. Uh, we're just about everywhere else. We are, by all accounts and purposes, uh, America's largest and number one specialty retailer in the mattress business. We have, at present, just south of 1,200 stores. We're in 78 markets across 28 states. Uh, and 90% of the stores we occupy are in markets that uh, were which we have a number one position. And I share that only to give, uh, again, a little more color or commentary for sort of um, our reality today. We had the good, the good privilege of becoming a public organization uh, this time last year, or a week ago. In fact, next, next week will be our one-year anniversary. And we've been very blessed to have a lot of sales momentum in terms of, in terms of growth, in terms of not only growth in, in, in revenue and in profitability, uh, but also in our existing base as well. In other words, it's not coming just uh, by virtue of adding new stores, although we have done a lot of that as well. We've been privileged to, uh, to be able to do really well in, in our same store base as well. Um, my view, uh, for, for what it's worth, in terms of part of the secret sauce for Mattress Firm has been our approach to how we engage with consumers. And, and uh, I don't know for most of you, uh, but, but typically we don't find that shopping for a mattress ranks very high on the scale of things I'd like to go do this, this upcoming weekend. And so we recognize that. In fact, we lean into it and we, we sort of uh, aspire for, for our approach to reconciling that reality to be a little bit different. From the way we recruit, uh, we recruit um, very heavily at college campuses. We believe in the, the merits of having an educated, uh, highly career-oriented uh, associate that can come in. Our compensation systems are aligned not only with the company's best interest, but really with our guests' best interest as well. We, we structure that a little bit differently from, from what uh, you may have experienced if you've gone to buy a mattress uh, at other places. Um, we are in the business of happy as well. Our tagline is to save money and sleep happy, and that, that, um, that sort of credo manifests itself in the way, that we, uh, the way that we price our product, the way that we give people an opportunity to test it out and the way that, uh, really, that we deliver it. We, de we deliver, much like Domino's Pizza, uh, in three hours or it's free, the, the, not the pizza or the mattress, but the delivery nonetheless, <laughs> uh, literally rolling out the red carpet for folks. And, and so that's sort of kind of a little bit of, of, of where Mattress Firm is today. Um, not a plug for Mattress Firm, but just to, uh, ju just to convey that we are certainly a high-growth organization and, and uh, growing faster and, 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 and more broadly than anyone certainly in our, in our category. And in the context of this um, conference today, the idea of talking about learning and, and leadership development, uh, I'll actually take a quick time out from where we are today and, and go back to Mattress Firm's beginnings in South Dakota in 1986. I would tell you that even 26 years ago, we certainly recognized uh, the importance of, of collaboration and having a very collaborative style for developing leadership. We really have a heritage that, 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 um, that, that, that is sort of steeped in that notion of leadership development. Quite specifically, three fraternity brothers come out of South Dakota trying to get anybody they knew that could come work for the company. I myself joined a few years later, and, and you want to talk about being connected and being collaborative, try living with your boss, uh, try having seven of your coworkers that are sort of scattered around a various apartment as you, you go in and get a business up and running. Many of us met our spouses at Mattress Firm, the hours that we've worked and the things that we've done over the years. It was really easy to be connected and collaborative when you come home from work and you're talking about what worked well and what didn't and having that not only at home, but if you wanted to go out socially, we didn't have any other friends. We're just a bunch of mattress people. Um, so we, it's, um, some, would, some would say it's uh, myopic, borderline, incestuous. We said it was a good opportunity to be collaborative uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and sort of help help uh, develop ourselves and grow. And truthfully, in all, in all, in all seriousness, the, that approach and that belief has been really part of our heritage for 
before, uh, since the beginning, and, and, it, and it worked for the first several hundred stores. But as we really began to experience uh, dynamic growth, it became challenging, as you might expect, to, to stay connected and to be as collaborative as folks moved. I myself had moved to 10 different cities by the time I was 10 years out of school with Mattress Firm, and, and, and that sort of growth happened all over the country. And, and so for us, the challenge then is, is how do you reconcile that? How do we find a way to preserve this heritage of connectedness and collaboration uh, even as we aspire to, 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 to grow as, as quickly as we are? And just to put it in perspective, a lot of this really has come even just in the last three years. We've doubled in store count uh, over the last three years. Um, uh, although we may not publicly uh, uh, comment on it, the, certainly the belief is we could double again uh, and relatively easily inside the next three years. Ours is an interesting industry. The top eight retailers in, in, the, in the betting industry comprise less than 25% of the entire industry. It's very fragmented. There is no national retailer in our space. And so this is really sort of a land grab and a race to be kind of the first border to border, coast to coast retailer. And yes, it's mattresses, but our approach is doing it a little differently in the bench, and the foundation for that is around sort of this, this, this culture of leadership. Uh, and, and, and so it's part of the challenge that we have is how do you keep it up? How do you continue to, to deliver on that experience for our guests and build the the benches to support it. We're not going to slow down anytime soon. I just mentioned uh, that, we, that we became a public organization a year ago. We publicly have committed to opening at least 100 stores a year for the next five years. This year, uh, inside the last 12 months, um, we, we're, we will have uh, added just south of 400. So when acquisition opportunities come up, we've had 13 acquisitions in the last 10 years. Uh, we will continue to pursue those in, uh, in sort of an opportunistic fashion. And we believe there is long-term potential for north of 2,500 stores stores uh, in a single brand inside the United States. So that's the backdrop of where we are today. Um, the, the question then becomes, how, how do you make sure that, that you're ready for it? And, and, and for us, building our bench is, um, it, it is really, as I sort of view it, the one thing that could stand in the way of this growth if, if, if we're not careful. Certainly, uh, we, we've, we've had good fortune on the real estate side of things, and, and to this point, good fortune in terms of building a, an engaged culture. We have very low uh, uh, turnover in our industry, even at the associate level. At the leadership level, it's practically non-existent. We've lost one district manager in the last five years, uh, you know, vol voluntarily anyways. And so, to put that in perspective, in, in our world in retail, for every 100 stores that we open, the, on average, we're going to try to, we're going to need to have about 10 district managers that, that come into that fold. For every 100 stores, we'll, or for every 10 district managers, we might add a regional manager. And so it, it, it's a pretty rapid acceleration. You go back to 2009, the average mattress firm tenure of those in the DM ranks at that point was north of seven years. Today, the folks that have been promoted in the last three years, their average tenure is less than half of that. And, it, and, and to this point, we've been able to keep up with it, but it is sort of this, this challenging reality for us. Our leadership development model, I recognize leadership development models are like opinions. Everybody's got one. My personal opinion, uh, we're only mattress folk after all, is to keep it simple. Uh, and for us, the four C's of building our bench, uh, the idea of, of, of not only recognizing, but now sort of more pursuing challenging assignments for our higher potential folks. Uh, coaching, certainly, um, and it's almost sort of cliche and blase to, to, to reference that. It's sort of a no-brainer, but it is something that's really important, even at the associate level, coaching after every customer conversation. And then uh, this notion of, of coursework for our folks, um, the, the idea that our industry can be somewhat sort of myopic, and if you're, if you're only looking at what the industry does, it doesn't necessarily lead to the level of innovation that, that we think is important to grow. And so this is sort of a way for us to introduce stuff outside of mattress world uh, into, into our world and to, 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 to spur innovation. And, and, and we view coursework, quite frankly, as a leading indicator of leadership potential. A, a lot of the programs that we uh, employ and, and really the, the platform that we use in partnership with Corp U is one um, that, that, that has a, a good way to sort of get out in front and see how engaged our leaders are, how willing uh, they're, they are to be committed to, to sort of advancing the conversation. And then this notion of community learning, certainly that's, I think, at the heart of, of the idea of, of collaborative learning. Is, if you want something, do you want it cheap? Do you want it, do you want it of high quality? Do you want it fast? Well, the reality for us is we have to have all three. And for me, that's sort of the framework of why this, this, this solution works. The ability to utilize social media 
to engage our folks. We hire a lot off the college campuses, of our, as I've talked about. So although you wouldn't know it from our point of sale system, which is a little arcane, at least uh, in terms of our leadership development, uh, we want to make sure that we, we have a, a media that aligns with, with uh, where folks are uh, already today in their own worlds. And then ultimately, really this idea of improving results through ongoing collaboration and trying to make things as real time as possible. I mentioned we've had a host of acquisitions. I'll, I'll just give you one quick example, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Mike, if you have you any have, more you have time, you have time, pictures of uh, planes or anything like that that you want to put up there. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see that, never saw that coming. But earlier, the, earlier this summer, uh, we, we were getting ready to go through an acquisition that, that spanned over seven different markets, 180 stores, 400 associates coming into the organization. Uh, and, and we were able to really, on a conver based on a conversation of where we were heading and, and uh, I'm busting this chops, but, but being um, good partners truthfully with this group and, and, or with Mike and Alan, talking about some of the challenges we had experienced in prior acquisitions, we had an opportunity to get Dave Patrick of Intel, formerly, or, uh, formerly of um, uh, uh, Charles Schwab and, and, and o, o on the, uh, the Corp U group to take us through a, a leading bold change course, literally in parallel with as we were sort of the final days before the acquisition uh, b became effective. And so we had 45 of our leaders going through this, this, this um, sort of community, created in this community to talk about change management and talk about what worked in the past. And it was and when we sort of debriefed what worked well, what didn't with the acquisition in general, um, this was one of the things that came out almost to a, to a person and certainly to a part of the country about having an opportunity to, to sort of be steeped in the moment and get real-time coaching in a way that they're hearing from, from peers. And so so for us, it you know may not be for everybody, but it is a it is a platform that works really well for us. And uh, and you know you take it on 200 stores, it really could tank the organization. We did it in the heart of summer selling season. It was wildly successful in, in terms of integration. So that's my sort of two cents on it. I thank you for the two minutes. I thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to be here, and I'll I'll turn it back to Mike. So thanks for that. So we are we we were going to do a little mic passing. Uh, I took too much time, so my fault. Um, Pen, uh, Ken was also in the Penn CLO program, just as a public service announcement for them. So now you know that one of the things they teach there is how to be loud, because we got loud down. Um, yes. But so just as my kind of last slide here, uh, there was a, a on the website for this conference. It asked, hey, this is or it said, this is why you need to be here. These were the areas that we were trying to touch on, and uh, and I. I I feel like we were successful at pushing back a little bit on helping you think about the way you do things today, not a sales pitch toward what you could be doing. We'd love to talk to you, of course, and I'm sure Ken and his team, he's got some members of the team, front, would love to talk to you as well about how they actually did it. Um, but our, you know, the, the takeaway headline for me is uh, push back on the way you're doing things. Don't, don't accept the, the, what you've been doing or what you're doing because you've always done it that way. And, and I think you'll be a lot happier and a lot more successful. Thanks a lot. We appreciate your time.